Welcome to our latest rebroadcast, podcast number 87, Spraying the Skies, the future of climate regulation featuring Mike from COT. This episode originally aired on June 22nd, 2024, exclusively on counciloftime.com. For more details, check the link in the description below. Join Michael from Council of Time as we explore eschatology and navigate today's challenges in this captivating episode number 87, Spraying the Skies, the Future of Climate Regulation. To gain deeper insights, visit the Council of Time's official website linked below. We're dedicated to providing truth, hope, and support to those struggling with addiction and seeking divine guidance. Your support helps us guide individuals towards truth, sobriety, and preparedness for the perilous times foretold in scripture. Join our exclusive Locals community for EGP family members and enjoy early access to exciting content. Thank you for being an integral part of the End Generation Project's success. Before diving into today's rebroadcast podcast, episode 87, titled Spraying the Skies, the Future of Climate Regulation, We're excited to announce the rollout of new features on our YouTube channel. We're introducing Super Chat premieres and a new merch store directly on the End Generation Project channel. You can now purchase our latest designs on a variety of merch, from hoodies to limited edition prints and posters. Stay tuned for these exciting updates coming soon. Your support through these past months has been crucial. These new features will allow us to reach more people offer more insightful episodes and expand our mission. By shopping with us, you're not just getting great products, you're making a meaningful impact on our community. We couldn't have come this far without the support of all our Inc. members and God's blessing. Visit our store now to explore our collection and help sustain our efforts. Thank you for your continued support and generosity. Good evening, everybody out there. Good evening. Hope that you guys can hear me. was uh, reviewing some of the radiation levels coming back from Mars. Mars has been inundated with uh, expected radiation from solar activity. Next, we are. Are you guys ready for that? We are next. In fact, I have a very special date that will be in the KD's section. That section, by the way, is changing the KD files, you guys will notice some rearranging of content in the KD sector, but Mars was inundated with radiation, and that is a good example of what can happen to us. Well, what will happen to us now, we have an atmosphere, of course, so in our case, you're looking at a thinning of the atmosphere that will Take the weather phenomenon that we have now and triple it. That's what that will do. So you're looking at very large extremes of hot and cold. If that were to happen to us, we still have an atmosphere. Um, But the difference would be in hot zones, you're looking at uh, 150 degree temperatures. And in cold zones, you're looking at probably minus 21. So it would be that type of contrast between heat and cold. I do not believe meteorologists are going to be able to accurately forecast anything after a given point. They don't have the tools, and their modeling data is not set up to track weather in those types of extremes. They have these formulas that will essentially round out the weather. They never forecast extremes. Even the temperatures go through a formula. But... What we're about to go through is going to make a difference all the way around, which means you guys are going to have to be careful in the sun. You should be right now careful in the sun, especially direct sunlight. And of course, everybody's going to start changing uh, as far as the cold is concerned. Many of you who live on the coastlines, you're going to find it difficult to live on the coasts. I, I suspect no one's going to live on the coasts. That's what I suspect. And I know that that, uh, most of these coastal cities and islands that are not fortified, they won't survive the meteor storm anyway. In other words, they're going to look like war zones. 
they will. Now, I can only hope that is reserved uh, for those who continue to go off the edge. In other words, those who are immoral and like morality, who hate, who hate the ways of our Father. Maybe that's reserved for them, but we certainly are in that date range to where this will, we're going to have to deal with that. Jupiter is going to be one of the biggest indicators that we have. Jupiter will be. Some of the more exotic energies and the heliosphere pulls back. Jupiter will essentially ignite. It will. Now, there, there are a few ages of physics to go over that could explain it. I'll, I'll let you guys know right now. In truth, if you take notice, physics has not explained most of what happens in celestial mechanics. What you may not know about celestial mechanics is orbital movements are not calculated with accuracy. This is a compensation for gravitational pull. This has happened since the first two successful launches of deep space probes, right? Voyager series satellites. And those compensation variables have always changed based upon our position or in our relationship with the sun and a few other forces, but they've been pretty consistent, meaning there is a perturber out there, something that throws the entire formula off, something that cannot be accounted for. And when you add in uh, certain gravitational influences, the formulas work. The, the orbit of the moon, for example, the formula for the orbit of the moon, <clears throat> it doesn't work by way of mathematics. It does on a simulation because you can add in things people don't know about. You can actually hide variables in a simulation. The orbit of the moon has about three constants. Given some of its rotation and angular speeds, they don't match up. But the sun is missing about, uh, I believe now the accurate number is 92% of its mass, which means, so something else is acting in tandem with us, right? And we're doing our best to observe, but it's, it is much like being an expert of an anthill, and all you've seen is the ant. We have to remember that we observe things from the surface of the earth. On occasion, we can observe things from probes, we do not know about the totality of the universe. Most of what you know about the universe is proposed. They are theories. They're not truth. They're just theories. Somebody's educated guess. Right? But as far as being absolutely sure, as far as it being accurate, no. These things are theories. Theories. A theory is not a fact. Right? And a fact is not truth. But... We don't even have all the facts. We narrow that down as we continue on. To better track some of these things, there'll be a launch coming up shortly. And with this launch, a special type of technology is going to be embedded with the GOSU weather satellite. These satellites that are being launched have more sophisticated optics to see what the sun is doing. Yes, that means the sun is taking center stage, right? So they need the advanced solar monitoring capabilities to continue to understand what the sun is doing. So we're getting a whole new series of geosatellites that will be launched and they're going to make a difference in some of the calculations. They'll also be used in tandem with some of the new type of techniques that are going to be employed to reflect uh, the sun's energy back. Listen to me carefully. They're going to sell it to the public. Whoever the U.S. president is going to be, they're going to have to sell it to the public. They're going to tell you guys, if they don't spray the atmosphere, if they don't do this, and, and this is going to be funny because no one would agree to this now, but I can almost guarantee you when the time comes, they will agree they will believe what they're being told. 
That's going to be one of the biggest mistakes anybody ever stepped into. But they're going to get everybody to agree to spray the skies. Everybody will agree to that. They're going to agree to it because the weather patterns here on this earth are going to become quite aggressive. And people will agree with it. You get the right people to tell the world that we need this. If they like that person, right? They're going to sell this idea. They're going to sell it. They will sell it and everything is riding on it. Think of, have you ever, possibly a movie, maybe a book or something like that, that a situation was so critical that they selected the most influential people in the world for the sole purpose, right? We're in something like that now. We are. And they're going to sell this idea. And people, well, based on who presents it, people will either accept it or not. Right? So uh, this is why. I, I can't go too far in it because I know you guys are still sensitive. You're very sensitive. But it will come through your favorite people. It's going to come through your favorite people. Right? You don't put a person, a salesperson, in front of the world that nobody likes. You have to put a salesperson in front of the world that everybody can get behind. Hmm? Everybody will get behind it, and everybody. When you buy a product, it used to be back in the old days when a salesman would come to your house, you'd see the product, it was vacuum, big deal, right? But if you like the person, you would buy the product based on the person infomercials same thing if the person can sell themselves and the product is relatively something you can use you end up buying the personality of the person so a good salesman right must have likability and when people like the person they buy uh, what the person is selling not because of the product because of the person if they like the person they will then convince themselves how that product is needed They'll say, yeah, I need that anyway. And they'll start doing the compensation thing for the person. So the key is, is to get a person that everybody likes. And then you sell the idea. Some things can be so critical that it will take an extreme character that people like to sell these ideas. And they will do it. Right now, if it were presented, everybody would say no. They say, no, we need more information. The day will come and you guys will hear it, but you're going to hear it with different ears. The only way you're going to remember any of this is to somehow remember this conversation. You guys are going to hear it. And the person is going to present it, though it's needed. And just about all of you will say, yeah, I can see where that's needed. That's a fact. That's true. That has happened so many times. And when nobody points it out, people go along with it without knowing. I have observed that happening. It is quite extraordinary, actually, because no one remembers the initial arguments. They buy the person so much. They cannot remember anything that opposes the idea. Because if a person is liked, they will sell you the science behind the idea. They will sell you the idea. And because you like that person, you'll fall into compliance with that individual. They're going to say, if they don't do this, the earth is going to heat up to a point where no life can exist on this planet. Yes, I know that sounds like sci-fi. But that is going to happen. And it's going to be a big mistake. Because once again, people will entrust the science of folks they have no idea about. And it will be about trust. It will. How many of you trust the world scientists right now? All of you do. Because you're still alive. If you did not trust the world's scientists, you would be dead. You compensate. Listen to me. Try to see this for yourselves. We compensate for the areas we don't know. You guys go into a grocery store. 
a convenience store. You do not question the manufacturer of those products. You simply get them. You get them. You don't know who made them. You don't know the procedure behind making them. Do you know that plastics degrade into food these days? And you ingest more polymers than you can imagine. But we blindly trust those who manufacture them based on what? Based on a word. If the public is not outspoken behind it, we give it that automatic trust. That's why I keep telling you guys, trust is not earned. That's foolishness. Trust is automatic until it's broken. Well, this spring is going to be the same way. The same way you guys go into a grocery store and you pick out your bread, you have a selection that's important. If you do not have a selection, you're going to be skeptical. If you have a selection, you'll not be skeptical. You'll simply choose to the best of your ability based upon available knowledge. And you're going to back up your own choices every single time. You guys understand that concept. How many understand that concept? How many understand that? When you read the ingredients, right, you cannot verify that those things are in that product, is my whole point. See how that works? You can read the ingredients all day. It doesn't mean that's what's in the product. But do you guys understand how that works? Do you see how that works? They want you to own your choices so that you will advocate for those choices. More than one item. More than one. They always have somebody speak against one of those items. They always do this. Somebody has to speak against one of those items. When this happens, they know that people have a frustration and a mistrust point. And so they redirect that to a product, to one of those products. And while the civilians launch a campaign against one thing, they're a thousand percent accepting of the other thing, not knowing that both come from the same source. See how that works? You guys see how that works? Somebody says the sound is cutting out. Is it okay? Is that all right, you guys? Somebody said one time, a long time ago, they were like, well, they, they were saying, we had, we, of course, when you walk around, when you be on the field a lot, there are many different things you have to fix your own water, right? He was too, and but he was a super health nut, and he he carried around these water tablets, and he wasn't really worried about the water. He said, "Oh yeah, I can purify my own water because I have these water tablets." You know, I just kind of looked at the guy, like really. He really trusted in those tablets. He did not manufacture himself. He really trusted in that. See, when you buy something and it becomes yours, do you not know that you support every reason behind why you bought it? This is part of having blind pride. Blind pride is when you defend your own actions. The world is also designed to cultivate blind pride. You will defend your choices. And when you defend your choices, you advocate for what you do over everybody else's choice. And when somebody accepts what you're, what, you know, what you're talking about, you feel even prouder about your choices. And when you make those choices, if it's killing you or not, you're still going to stick with that choice to save face. That's what happens. We have good sounds running out of water. Mixler is fine. God bless you, Rick T. 
Some people in Mixler said that their small sound cutting out. Some people in COT, well, the sound is fine. It may be regional. Guys, there have been internet problems since yesterday in various places based on where you live at. You may have some communications interruptions. Okay, I'm not cutting in and out, so it's the individual user. If you are cutting in and out, you might want to refresh your systems. You may have had it on too long. Maybe you have some connection issues or severe lag of time. Okay, so anyway, guys, you do understand that. Though. I'll say it again. When you pick something out, you become a defender of that product and the reasons why you bought that. So you, nobody wants to make the wrong choice, right? Nobody wants to do that. And so we always end up defending. When we select something from a large selection, we always end up defending our choices. Because to not defend your choice means that you openly acknowledge one of two things. Either you have no knowledge about what you're doing, or you made the wrong decision. And nobody really likes to admit on a daily basis that they made the wrong decision. So, But I want you guys to see this. Because... That's how they get you. When the debate comes, the choice is bound to be made when the choice is made. People defend the choice without even knowing the contents of it. They do this every single time with everything in life. The world's systems are set up in, in, in very intricate ways. Books, school books, the news media, the colors they use with every single corporation Right, has to comply to psychological standards. Did you guys know that? Maybe you didn't know that. Colors affect people in different ways, and they know this, right? So there's a conformance policy or a standard operating procedure in which everybody has to comply to certain standards. And they have everybody replicate what works for somebody else, right? People love doing that. They say, well, you know, if somebody else's thing works, let's just go, you know, get some of their stuff. If you see something really working in the earth, you better believe that there's some minds behind it that have gone through all the checks and balances to make sure that it they maximize their attention grabbing of you. And because they know that people follow success, all you have to do is pour your money into something and make it be successful. Thus, set a new standard, and everybody will conform to this new standard. It's an easy form of control. It works. Oh, it works so well. You know, when they're planning operations overseas, for example, they found these things out and they employ those strategies quite a bit especially in starting a war, changing the mind of the populace in that specific place, talking to those government officials to get them to debate over choices you've given them, right? To have a person select something and make them believe it's their selection when in truth you handed them. And whatever they select, they have pride in. Once they have pride, they teach their people. Once the people are taught, the people have pride behind what they agree with. And then once you have that blind pride behind something, you start fighting for it. It becomes part of your identity. And you begin fighting for something that was never yours in the first place. These are strategies employed all over the world. And they work. They work because they play upon the blind pride of a human being. In fact, they play upon most of your desires and a lot of your dreams. They make a person feel like they belong. And if you can make a person feel like they belong, you've got them. I'm sharing this with you in, in the hopes that when the day comes, you won't be... <clears throat> like the rest of the world will be. They will not. 
And I would hate to say anything about the pastors of that day, because I believe that most of the pastors of that day are going to be very light in what they say. It'll be a total departure away from those things of Christ that really grounded us in faith. They're going to mutate, alter, change the whole thing. The entirety of what we are used to right now will not be. They will make all things inclusive as they are doing now. Until the word's not involved with what they're doing here on this earth. There are some case in points I could use, but I can't do that. You guys are too sensitive. You are. When you're betrayed, you have to be betrayed first. Your feelings have to be hurt first. And once your feelings are hurt, well, then we'll talk about it. But these are tactics. That always work. They play upon your vulnerabilities. And they're highly successful. So that means they will spray the skies. With the blessing of the people. They will. Hopefully, you can get ahead of it. Hopefully, you guys will remember a portion of this conversation. So that when you see what happens, when they start spraying and everybody's saying, oh, yes, we need it. You'll say, wait a minute. Didn't somebody say something about this spraying a while ago? You may not remember who it came from. But you remember the conversation slightly enough to interrupt your thought processes. And maybe you'll snap back to sobriety say wait a minute I know what they're doing this is a mistake yet again anyway this launch will take place a few launches are going to take place I mean a few when I say a few I mean a few and all will be dedicated to the sun right? indirectly like this launch with the new geos weather satellite stations right that's actually dedicated to the sun for observation of the sun advanced tools to monitor the sun. That's what it's for. But they can't tell you that because you would get nervous. So they just slap that name Geos on there. Right? They swap out the hardware, this, that, and the other, and they give it a launch, and nobody cares. Nobody cares. Somebody says, what will the spring do? They're going to tell you that the spring is necessary to reflect the sun's deadly rays back to it, out from Earth. But if they do not, we're going to cook. Now, you guys will agree with that, too. Hmm? And they have to tell everybody because it will change the color of the sky temporarily. So it's not going to be some passive event. Or it's not going to be the aluminum that they've been spraying. And that's what they've been spraying since World War II. Aluminum. In fact, if they did not spray those particulates in the air, we'd be about 15 degrees hotter than what we are right now. 15 degrees. We would. Yeah, it's going to be something... Well, it's going to change the color of the sky. Right? If it were not going to change the color of the sky, they wouldn't tell anybody. They would continue doing what they're doing now. Right? They have to have, just like our heliosphere, is, you know, it covers the entire solar system with a magnetic shield. So they spray the atmosphere of the Earth. All nations do this, by the way, not just one, all nations. Air traffic is a very convenient thing because the, the air traffic covers the, the entirety of the globe. Some of the phone systems are interlinked with, with um, air travel. Right? Ground observations are interlinked with air travel. You're looking at something that flies in the skies all the time. And you just mount little devices on there 
right? And you can utilize those aircraft to monitor the surface of the earth and below to do extraordinary things. You're told about the one purpose. You're familiar with the one purpose. But you guys who are who know about electronics, you know how small electronic packages are. Right? You know how small devices are. They can do quite a bit. So imagine an aircraft with a 10-pound payload. What could you do with 10 pounds of electronics? You could do just about everything with 10 pounds of electronics. And what weight difference is that on an aircraft? 10 pounds? Big deal. That's, you know, that's negligible weight. 10 pounds is. It is. Hmm? So they utilize all of this. Why do you think they're not able to really, you know, do anything with them? You have Boeing, right, with these issues. Why is no one doing anything? Why? You have these people crying out, and no one is doing anything. That's unheard of. Why? Because they don't want to do anything. That will upset the company. And it just so happens is the people that everybody wants to prosecute, that person knows how that company operates. And if that person is missing, that company could fall apart. So they're not going to do anything to that person. And indeed, to this day, nothing has been done. We have some severe problems here. But I do have one encouragement. Right? Did you guys read about, uh, I think it was Louisiana? Did you guys read about that? And the, I believe it's Louisiana, and the Ten Commandments. Hmm? Did you guys read about that? How that the schools are posting the thing. Somebody says, I'm confused. No, you got that backwards. It's, it's not about being grateful for any spray. We're not talking about the spray they've been doing. No, we're talking about the spraying that's coming. I'm just telling you why they've been spraying since World War II. And I'm not talking theory, so it may not align with what everybody else has talked about. It may not align with that. I normally don't get into these subjects. Because people have written books, right? Possibly they wrote books about what they thought was real. I do not want to be the one that derails anybody's books. Right? I love for people to know the truth, but unfortunately, if you like the author of a book, you'll defend that author. And if you defend that author, we have a contradiction of information which causes more confusion. And I'd rather not get into that because nobody wins in that. I also do not want to be the one that will disrupt someone's livelihood. I don't want to do that. So there's always a time and a place for things. And in the near future, a spring event will take place. And the world... It's going to be a thousand percent behind it. So will most of you. Unless you can remember what we just talked about. But again, back to the encouraging information. That was quite encouraging with Louisiana. I'll tell you why. I know that the Lord can alter anything he so desires. Now we have an equator problem, right? We have an equator problem because we have an earth rotation problem. Everything is changing in the solar system. and But I know this. I know that if these states begin to, and the people adopt these changes, there's no way the Lord will allow those places to undergo disastrous times. He won't do it. He'll alter anything he so desires to alter. Now, Louisiana has been under fire from storms and everything else, right? Watch what happens. I want you guys to see this. Just watch. Because your father's word is real. And what he said is real. So watch what happens. Please watch what happens. A state that would do that, and you have to check the motive. If it's a divisive motive, the Lord said never, ever do that. I'm just telling you now. In other words, if they stuck that up there to get back at somebody, they're going to pay tenfold what they were going to pay for. Do you hear me? 
if anybody uses those things of the living God for some fight here on this earth, they're going to pay for it dearly. They're going to pay. That is outright darkness is what that is. If they're genuine behind the reasons. See, because if they're doing it to gain support of a human being, that whole place is going to go under. It's going to go under. But if they're doing it out of a genuineness, it has nothing to do with scoring points, with new leadership or something like that. Watch what the Lord does. Watch what he does. When you honor the Father in view of men, so will he honor you in the view of the angels. But if you deny him in view of men, he'll deny you before the angels. Why is that so important? Because the angels carry out God's word here in this earth. They carry it out. If they have done this to score points with humanity, to get favor with a person, they really messed up. They should have used Dr. Seuss's stuff, not the father's stuff, right? If it's not authentic, people ought not use the father's word. That's what Israel was destroyed for more than once. For using God's word. Using God's word to gain favor. With surrounding nations. Using God's things. To gain favor. With nations round about them. They were destroyed. For such things. So but we'll find out. That'll be something quite obvious to the Christian community, and I hope they're not using it. Like ancient Israel did. But if I'm encouraged by it, if it's good, but if it's not, I'm just giving you the warning. I have to give you the whole thing. Because Israel has everything we do that, that the world is doing right now, Israel has gone through these steps, and all these steps are in the Bible. And the outcome is in the Bible. Those things that happen to Israel, right? No other country has undergone what Israel has undergone since its inception. No other place on this earth has been treated like them. No other people has gone through the hardships of Israel. Why? Because they kept, they kept, they kept, they kept walking away from the word. Every time they would suffer, they would draw close to God. As soon as they were repaired, they fornicated with the nations around them. They began to mingle what the Lord had given them concerning his word with the word of others around about them. So every time they were okay, they drifted away from the living God. And then they would end up back in that impoverished state again without a nation. And then they would serve the living God again. Our lives are the same way, right? We suffer. What do we start doing? We start praying. We start conforming our lives to the word of God. As soon as we get what we want, what do we do? We start justifying ourselves. We start arguing and fighting with other people. We become right about the scriptures and everything else. But when our lives tear down and they break down, we become humble. We're, we don't count ourselves the experts in his scriptures. We don't do that. We start listening. We're long suffering. We're very patient with people. Why? Because when you're beat down into a corner, you're truly humbled. Then when you're built back up again, pride steps in again. It steps in, and we think we're right about everything in God's word. And then we fall again. Lord have mercy. Why do we have to continue to go into these vicious cycles ourselves? If we can only remember the place of humility we were in, if we can only remember the truth we learned in that place, in that valley of humility. 
if we can only recall the sincerity of our prayers, the nature of our prayers during that time when we were abased, if we can only remember that, we would do well. But why is it that when we're built up, we become prideful? God forbid that ever happen to me. I refuse to be prideful. It is useless, it's dangerous, and if you're not careful, if your mind drifts away from the Almighty, you instantly become prideful. Okay. Hopefully, Louisiana, you're doing the right thing for the right reasons. And the Lord does not play with his word. He does not. When people do that openly, God will make an open show of their position. So I pray they're doing it right. Because they live too close to water, they can easily be overrun, overtaken. And we all know that. We all know some pretty big monster storms are forming. And when they start sweeping places, right, you're going to see God will not decimate his own place. He'll never do that. He already said that. He'll never do that. <clears throat> Some places appear to be his. But God will never allow calamity to come upon his own places. We're the ones that allow calamity to come upon God's places. Because we make his place secondary. And we make our places, right, primary, don't we? Our highest priority is our stuff. I'll tell you something, though. When your love for the Lord grows, when you see the gospel of Jesus Christ for what it is, when you know it's the only thing that can save humanity, it will be first and foremost in your life. And your life will take a back seat to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, this brings us to the point of what's really first in our lives. ask you guys something is is in truth don't answer out loud but is the lord's gospel truly first in your life to put the lord's gospel first is to put the lord first put the lord to put the lord first is to put the word of god first to put the word of god first is to put god first it was the gospel of jesus christ is it really first in your life? Can you really see its importance? How critical it is for all life? Can you? We'll talk about that when I get back. I'm going to take a break in just a few minutes. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. Guys, I certainly do hope that this Louisiana bill that was passed, this mandate... For the Ten Commandments to show in every classroom is, is every school is good. It was authentic. But also, you guys do understand it takes a conservative president to back the states with anything like that. Whether you be a Democrat or Republican, it is a known fact that Democrats will not back the Ten Commandments like that. They always put the priority of the living God in the back seat. They do. Right? It's not it's not their first uh, priority. They are an inclusive body. So they believe in the sovereignty of each individual person. Which is I mean, I believe in that too, right? I do. I believe that each individual has made their own choices. But I believe strongly that this nation, first and foremost, was founded upon principles given by our Father in heaven, not these other things. I don't believe in the other things. I just don't. And I never will. For the most part, this country has been slowly drifting away from all the anchors of anything that has to do with Christ. That a great perversion of the name Jesus has taken place and it started in this country. 
never, never in history since the earth was, I believe, has anybody defamed the name of the Lord as this country has, using the name of Jesus in jokes and allowing it with no reprisal, no anything. Jokes about the Holy Ghost and allowing that to be shown in every home in America. Pushing what is an abomination to the Most High. The value system has been torn to shreds in this country. And the Lord is coming back with an eviction notice. This spirit of entitlement. And yes, people usurp everything good. Because I'll tell you this, while the Ten Commandments, if it is authentic, then good for them, right? And if we do end up having a conservative president, then that'll back the Ten Commandments. But here's the problem. Satan always has a way, right? No matter the good a person does, if they are not grounded in Christ, Satan will usurp their power and pervert everything. Do you hear me? Those same Ten Commandments that are posted in every, that are going to be posted, right? That same law could be used to mock God in a very great way. If Christ is not involved, if the people are not covered by the blood of the Lamb, Satan will use them. He will target them, utilizing the word of God to pervert the minds of many. If whoever that president is is not covered by the blood of the Lamb, Satan will use that president. Period. So I hope that you guys are aware of that fact. You never forget that. It doesn't matter how good a person is or what a person can or cannot do. It matters if they're covered by the blood of the Lamb. If they're not covered, Satan will use them and pervert them thus perverting the country even further. That's how cults get started. No one wakes up and says, you know, I think I'm going to start a cult. These people, they begin with a gift of some sort, a gift to reach people, a gift of gab, so to speak. And all of a sudden, they're not devoted to Christ. And everything they do gets perverted. And they start leading people away from the Most High. When Satan gets a hold of their minds, he convinces them somehow that they're divine. See, when anybody starts pointing out to another human being, say, ooh, that person's divine, I back off. There's no human being divine. Not in that respect. And the Bible is quite clear, both about the absence of divinity in the earth and the return of divinity in the earth that people would recognize it. Right now it's in a hidden realm. It's not meant for people to see. It's an authenticator of those who are authentic. We're not here to have to, to impress people to convert them. No. By way of truth, people are converted. By way of faith, people are converted. Not by proof. Because right now at this point, all I can, all I can see is a, it's a great darkness that can unfold very quickly. It'll be followed by much death. But that's up to you all. You have the power to halt it. You do. Nobody else does. The world does not. You do. And if you're sitting back hoping that the world is going to make the wrong, the right decision, you've already messed up. They cannot make the right decision because they do not have the truth. That was explained in the Gospel of John, chapters 13 and 14. The world does not have the truth. You do. God called you to make the difference, not them. God put the gospel in you. He put the belief in you, not them. But how many of you, in truth, out of the sincerity of your heart, 
not pray that your way be established in the earth, but absolutely pray for your enemies and those you like, as though they are one and the same. How many can see that Satan is behind these people? See, every time people come out and point their finger against a person, they deny the word of God, period. That's a denial of the word of God. If the Lord tells us that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, then why do people continue to wrestle against flesh and blood? Why do people continue to blame the person? We know that when Satan is bound a thousand years, why is no one sinning on the earth? Why is that thousand years of peace called a thousand years of peace? Because Satan is bound a thousand years. He's loosed. That's when he deceives, deceives people again. So you're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but the spirits that influence people to do these sinful things. Look at your own life. Did you conjure up the things that you do? Or did something enter into your thoughts and speak to you concerning the sin you were about to do? Did you not have a conversation about the sin that you were involved in? It is so easy. Because there's an ongoing conversation in your mind about your choices. And something is in your mind. It's always trying to give you the easy route always trying to scare you into taking the quick route. But there's always the cautionary voice. And it says very quietly, do it the Lord's way. And every single time it speaks, that other voice will say, well, the Lord's way is not convenient. I could lose everything. I could be sent back to the beginning of my life. I could, this bad thing can happen. That bad thing can happen. That's what the voice says. You entertain both of them. Before you choose to sin, did you not have an argument with yourself in your mind? Before you did that wrong thing, didn't you have a conversation to attempt to justify why you had to do it? Hmm? And how long did you sit there to convince yourself you had to do it by way of your thoughts? Well, I have to do it this way. I know it's not right, but just this one more time. This will get rid of the problem. Didn't you have a conversation with yourself? When you did agree to sin, for the most part, Isn't that the core reason you were surviving? In fact, that's the difference of the good and the evil in this earth. But a good person who is born of God has not gone through their full conversion. Most of the sin that they, can, that they perform in the earth is that they are trying to survive. They do what they do to try and survive. An evil person, they have true enjoyment within iniquity. I'm not talking about drinking alcohol. No, we're talking about when you're in the world, you're doing certain things it's to survive. And most of you have sinned against yourselves. You didn't involve anybody else. Hmm? Think about that. Most of you, most, most, the majority of you have no desire to harm anybody else. You had no desire to do that. Even the nature of your sins were different. My point is this, something was talking to you, telling you you had to survive, telling you it was the only way. Something pressured you into making that choice prematurely, fast. Hmm? You were trying to be saved from embarrassment, from being put in the spotlight and everything else. 
you saw no way forward but absolute nothingness in your path. And you made a choice to continue in the earth. So when you look upon a person who's trying to survive, why would you blame the person? When you look at people who don't have that deep relationship with the Messiah, because if they did, there's no way they would speak the way they're speaking. You know they're at war. Why do so many saints agree with Satan in somebody's life? I can't do that. I cannot do that. I cannot look at a person and say that person is a scumbag or something. I can't do that. Because that's being in agreement with Satan. I'm in agreement with Satan. I agree with the Lord, not Satan. Satan says people are condemned. That's what he wants. And every time we condemn a person, we are in agreement with Satan. That carries consequences in our lives. You don't want the consequences? Stop agreeing with Satan. But you have to see it for what it is. Somebody says, is there a way to silence the voices? Yes, it is. Stop entertaining them. Stop pondering what they say. Hmm? Don't worry about the tapping. Don't worry about any of that stuff. Don't ponder what they say. See, a lot of people, it's like, it's like often, you know, let's take Angela, for example. Angela will read emails. Some of those emails are horrific she get upset. And I'll say, Angela, don't read them anymore. I'll tell Angela, put them on the block list, block their cause, don't deal with it. Don't deal with it. Don't entertain it. Don't entertain it at all. See, in the Bible it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. It did not say entertain the devil and he'll flee. You help out your fellow man by cutting him off often, ladies. You know that? When somebody cannot help themselves, don't you think in your mind that somehow you can fix a person? You cut it. You have to cut it. Cut communication immediately. You have to block that call, then so be it. But don't feed. Don't feed the excitement in those spirits like that. Don't do that. Everybody does not have control of themselves. And if you are a vessel who truly loves the Lord, then of course, dark entities are going to pile up in a person to get to you at any opportunity they get. That's why I don't talk to females. I already know what will take place. That's why I don't do it. Not outside of Angela. I won't do it. And I advised her, don't talk to any males outside of me. It'll change everything. I certainly will not do it. Because I know how the enemy is. I can see him working. Often I can see what he's up to. Like things decent and in order. And sometimes people cannot help. Not everybody is disciplined. In that area of desire. Not everybody is disciplined. And I like to help people. To help them. I do not like to feed. What they're struggling with. A person is not defined. By what they're struggling with either. There are awesome people out there. Who have some very deep flaws. And weaknesses. You have to help build those people up against those weaknesses. You do that by way of truth, decency, the gospel, the real gospel. Being authentic. Being authentic. But this, this year, 
is a life and death year in truth. It is. I know that all of you can sense this. There's something permanent about this year. It's like somebody's going to make a statement. And that statement can never be retracted. And it's important that we begin to see people the Lord's way. Because if you agree with Satan concerning a human being, you have just sown in to death itself, and you shall reap death upon yourselves. You know what happens when a person reaps death? They feel stuck. They start to change in a very drastic way. Employ those things. Be witnesses of the gospel of Jesus Christ and how it returns back into your life. Reaping what you sow is just not for bad stuff. Many of you out there, you need certain things you need in your life. So start sowing them in truth. Don't sow them to get something out of life. Go forward with an upright heart in everything that you do as best you can, as best you can. Utilizing everything that you can to go forward. And see the salvation of the Lord in them, what the Bible says. How are you going to see the salvation of the Lord if you don't experience the salvation of the Lord in these multitude of areas that are not worked out in your life? That means a great opportunity is before you. If you are to see the salvation of the Lord, you have to experience the salvation of the Lord. That means your breakthrough. That's what that means. That means that Jesus has given you the way to do it but it must be done in truth. You want to see the salvation of the Lord? Then walk forward in righteousness. Walk forward in the ways you know of, not in the ways you don't know of. So don't sit back and say, well, I can't walk forward because I don't know enough. No, you walk forward in those things you know. And be a good steward of those things you know and have. And see the salvation of the Lord. You've got everything you need to start that process. You've got everything you need right now to begin that process. You want things to be broken in your life? Then utilize what you have. And stop talking about what you don't have. Walk forward in what you know and stop contemplating all of what you don't know. Be a steward over whatever the Lord has given you. Be true to those things and be a witness, a direct witness for yourselves. Don't let the evil one talk you into sitting down another day to wait upon something else with what the Lord has given you already. Go forward in righteousness with integrity. For the Lord's sake. Did you hear me? Don't go forward with a plan in your head, with a deal in your mind. Go forward with integrity for the Lord's sake. Remember something. Everything you do for the Lord, you must do out of your heart, and it must be a giveaway. If you are trying to get something in return, that's a deal. We're not here to make a deal to do something righteous so we can reap righteousness. That's not why we're here. We're here to go forward in righteousness regardless of what we weep. The Father has principles. Stop focusing on the things that will come back and focus on what you can give forward, going forward. That's what you focus on. Stop thinking about how you can salvage what's behind you and let me go ahead and sow here so I can salvage that. Stop doing that. Go forward. Ready to give up everything for righteousness' sake. 
That means you need a real relationship with the Lord, a true one. So meditate upon his sacrifice. With what you know, look back at the cross again and see it. Don't turn away from the pain your Messiah went through. Don't turn away from all the things that took place in between. See his resolve. See what he went through so that your slate, your everything against you could be wiped out. See what he went through. Because when you do, you'll go forward not thinking of anything that anybody is going to give you. But you'll go forward ready to give everything because the Lord did everything for you already. I will be going forward in truth without some plan attached to it. Don't go forward by strategy. Have an understanding of what the Lord has done for you and simply accept it. If somebody took my place in court, and absorbed all the charges. But I was guilty of those stains. But they went to go serve my sentence. And I knew about what they were trying to establish in the earth. And they were a good person. Do you not know? I wouldn't ask for anything in return. Because that is unbelievable. Imagine you're accused of something. And you know you're guilty. Here comes a stranger. They walk up to the front and they say, I'll serve this person's sentence. Don't let them go free. Do you really think I could just go back out to my normal life and just live it up? No. Every day I would think about this person that's serving my sentence that did not have to, but took it upon himself. And I'm roaming free. I get a new sleep because this guy gave up his life and everything for my sake and they took it anyway there would not be a day that would go by I would not recall what this person did for me a day would not go by a moment would not escape me that I wouldn't be mindful of what this person took upon himself and they didn't have to that was what Jesus did for you tell you people are not thinking about that because if they were there'd be no way they could go forward in certain ways when you come to terms with the truth that the innocent gave up their life served your sentence in full when you did not deserve it right they are serving your sentence in full they paid the price in full if a person truly received all of that. There'd be no way they could do it just one time for all time. No, that would be on their minds every day. Because that innocent person that took upon themselves all my charges, how could I sit in the lap of luxury knowing that this person is punished And all of the suffering that was reserved for me, this person took it upon themselves. How in the world could I just totally wipe that out of my mind? The Lord did that for us. He suffered for us. See, that little term, take sins upon yourself, we, we use that as though it's separate from suffering. The Lord took the suffering that was due you upon himself. He did not charge you for it. That was his gift to us. How could such a gift be given? And how could that not be enough for those who say they believe? See, for me, it's enough. 
I don't need anything additional. It is enough. It is everything to me. Because I'm not in denial. I don't try to deny those things I've done. I don't need anything in return. All my life I've been trying to say thank you. Do you know that? And nothing is ever sufficient. So every day I'll try harder to say thank you. Thank you to the one who took upon himself all that was due to me. That's why I'm not looking for anything in return. His sacrifice was totally sufficient. It was enough. It was complete. It's everything to me. That's in my heart and mind. That's why I don't look for anything in return. When I see darkness moving to blind people from that, when I see Satan's hand to desensitize the world, to make them forget about the cross, of an act that someone did for them, at no price to them, no charge to them, they didn't have to do anything for it. It was done from love's perspective, and it was absolute and total. When I see darkness blind a person from that, I'll never blame that person. But that darkness is not authorized to stay in the presence of righteousness. So you could say it's a hunt. But I'll never condemn a person. You know why? Because I was condemned. And the Lord said, no. How can I condemn somebody when I was condemned? And the Lord said, no, this one will not be condemned. How can I think upon somebody and say, you know, that person, we'd be better off if that person was dead. Because the world would have been better off if I were dead. How could we so easily agree with anybody? Who would ever say this person deserves death and that person deserves death and that person is not worth the air they breathe? How can we agree with that? When that was truly a thought upon us. We set that position for real. We are sinners saved by grace. We did not earn it. No one owed that to us. But out of love, the Lord did it. So no, I'll never side with darkness. I will not agree with Satan to destroy somebody else. But we'll seek for a person to be free. To have the liberty of Christ in their lives. Because he, listen, what he died not just for me, but for the person Anybody would accuse. He died for them too. And these things like this are not spoken of. How easily forgotten they are. And when they're forgotten, nobody acts on them. And when nobody acts on them, other voices begin to rise. Voices rise that justify the demise of other folks. In this political environment, you don't think darkness is working to cause the saints to condemn people? Satan knows he has but a short time 
And he's causing saints. He's causing people who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb to reject their own redemption. Satan is so sneaky. is incredibly sneaky. Most of the world is bored with it. They don't want to hear it, though they can't remember it. They don't want to hear it. Most are caught up in the euphoria of this season itself. In the scriptures, it did say men will become lovers of self more than God. That means a person will defend their own ideologies. And they will not suffer the Lord's truth to get in the way. This is what you see happening. I swear there's a work to be done like no other time in history. We'll be back in a few minutes right here at COT, everybody. Okay, everybody, I'm back once again. I am back. Somebody says we have to stand up and demand accountability. Lord, thank you for not demanding accountability of me. Thank you, Lord, for not doing that. But a person holds a position. How do you stand up and demand accountability? By the way, it's God that takes care of your children. If see, if God's protection was not over anybody, their life would cease right at that very moment. People want to stand up in their own power to go against darkness. You'll die trying. A person is only protected by the hand of God. That's it. People have forgotten they're being protected. Now, if you stand up against the forces of darkness and demand accountability, in what spirit are you going forward in? Hmm? That's what you have to ask yourself. Don't go forward in the spirit of flesh. You will fail. People have miserably failed all these years. I've heard that statement so much. I've seen people do it, and they failed every single time they failed. Why? Because it went forward in flesh. We fight the good fight of faith. Hmm? This is truly going to be a dividing line. It's also going to be the great falling away. I'm going to call it the great falling away. Everybody says the great deception. There is no great deception. There's a strong delusion God will send. God will give people over to a strong delusion that they would believe a lie, that they all might be damned who loved not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. In every single case in the word of God, when the children of God seek the living God for changes in the earth, the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, makes those changes. So that means every effort, if you stand up, stand up in flesh and demand accountability, you'll be usurped by darkness and it will turn evil. That's how Satan works. That's exactly what he wants. He wants a person so frustrated, they'll stand up within themselves, absent the Holy Spirit, go forward by way of their mind, so he can usurp the whole situation and maximize a killing blow. When will we learn that without the Lord, we can't do anything? Isn't that in the Bible? Somebody says there's both a deception. No, there's no deception. There's a delusion. There's no deception. That's people talk that up, a great deception. God says a person cannot be deceived unless they be drawn away by their own heart. So how can there be a great deception unless a person wants to be deceived? If a person is deceived, then they wanted the very thing they're drawn to. A man is drawn away and tempted of his own lusts. Therefore, there is no deception. Even in the Bible, it says, if it were possible, and it's not possible, right? It says, even the very elect would be deceived 
by means of the miracles and all this other stuff that were being done in the earth. So if they are going to get close to be deceived, the Lord won't allow it. He's not going to allow it. He already said he won't allow it. If it were possible, the very elect would be deceived. But as concerning this, a person being deceived, God said not so. God said a man is drawn away and tempted of his own lusts. Nobody can deceive anybody unless you want something, right? If, if a child it doesn't like lollipops, I cannot coax that child to come close to me to get the lollipop. He has to like lollipops. Right? A man is drawn away and tempted of his own lusts. These are biblical principles versus the words of people. Look up all these cases of that word deceived in the Bible, and you'll see it yourselves. You'll see it. People are talking about a great deception. The Antichrist, he's, what is the Antichrist going to do? He's going to draw those of whom he has an investment in. So those who have evil, deceit in their hearts, those who have this mentality of flesh in their hearts, they're going right to him. That's a vacuum. That's part of a strong delusion. No one will escape that strong delusion. Hmm? No one. If a person is truly deceived, they're drawn away and tempted of their own lusts. So you have to have something in you to be pulled to it. If it's not in you, you cannot be pulled to it. How many of you can I deceive into running face first into a wall full of nails? You may think that, yeah, if you hide the nails, that's not how, that's not how anything in reality works. Nothing in reality works like that. Nothing. In other words, every single moment when a person was deceived into doing something, they liked it. They had to like it first to be drawn into it and started out tiny and small and they got the warnings. See, if somebody could truly be tricked, then the protection of Christ is of no effect. Hmm? It's of no effect. Think about it. It'd be of no effect. If I could be deceived, truly deceived, truly tricked, Right? then the power of Christ is of no effect. I'm in danger, aren't I? That means Satan won. Satan has not won. God makes apparent everything we're drawn into. We know that when we're drawn into something, it's because it has something we like. We get the warnings. We get the cautions. We get everything. And what do we do every single time? If we forego those warnings and cautions, we get in trouble, don't we? Everybody knows this, don't we? We know this. So it's not like a wall with nails in it that you can't see the nails. That's in Hollywood. No, that's not how reality works. God will give you a hint. Oh, you see that, see that pattern poking out? There's something sharp behind there. Don't run face first into it. What do we do? What do we do? What? Man is drawn away and tempted of his own lust. Of his own lust. That deceived part, that implies a person can truly be tricked. That also implies the power of Christ is of no effect. Who protects the children? Who guides a child's life? The Lord said, you know what the, you know what the Bible says? The angels of a child are always in front of the father. Don't mess with children. Those things that happen in your life open up your life to a language, to sight, to spiritual discernment that nobody else has. The only way somebody can have your spiritual discernment is if they go through your childhood. So that bad childhood a person went through that they used to say, well, Satan got to me then. No, God purposed that to open up your eyes now. You know what the problem is? We place too much value on the flesh. Right now, the world teaches everybody to save their flesh. Everything the world does is to save your skin. Everything the world does is to try and make you live another day, a, a longer time than you're supposed to live. That's what the world does. They're preoccupied with doing that. Your father is not. Your father wants your soul to live. And when you were damaged as a child, nothing touched your soul. It only touched your flesh. You're going to get rid of that flesh anyway. Think about it. Somebody said we have to, well, the more we know of these things, 
right? Do, do you see how sobering this is when you consider the word of God versus the words of men? And if we don't put the words of men in check with the word of God, then we have these runaway ideologies. And then you have generations that believe in the ideologies of men and they don't know anything about the, the principles of Christ, right? This causes entire generations that just, you know, they're just not going to make it. Why? Because there's, what did the Bible say? There's no knowledge of God in the land. Can you see how? Because all these rumors and all these clever sayings, all of them, people think are biblical and they're not. The scriptures that the Lord talked about are coming true. There will come a time when it will be very difficult to find the word of God in the earth. Think about that. That means even right now, the true word of God is being lost. Even right now, can you see how? Can you all see how? Right now, people are interested in what they think about Scripture, and they promote what they think about Scripture. They're not promoting the Scriptures. You see how that works? So now people have all these thoughts of men in their heads, and they don't have the actual Scriptures in their heads. That's causing people to be powerless. It's weakening the body. And the Lord told us this time would come. Right? I, you can't blame men for this. You can't blame that. This is something the Lord said would be. But you can combat this of those around you. Right? Some of you feel like, well, you know, what I think won't save anybody. But you can influence those appointed around you. Stop trying to save the world. And just simply save that little world in front of you. Let that little one in front of you be your world. Concentrate on fighting the good fight of faith for that. Whatever the Lord put in your life for you to be a caretaker of. Don't get discouraged because you cannot change your neighbor's mind. Just hold the value system of Christ with that little one in front of you. Mm, that's your world. Your world is not the entire globe. Your world is what the Lord assigned to you. That's your world. And if each of us would be that, my, my. Hmm? Hmm? Somebody said, Jesus, Jesus said a few times, he said more than a few times, don't be deceived. Now, why would somebody ever say don't be deceived? That means you have a choice in being deceived or not, doesn't it? Think about it. You can't say don't be deceived unless you have a choice in being deceived, correct? Is, isn't that correct? There we are. See, Jesus already opened up that word deceived. He already told us about deceived. Then you can't tell somebody don't be deceived unless you have the power not to be deceived. So that means there's a choice involved. See how that works. There's no tricks. See, in somebody's life, somebody heard that tonight and Satan, you just lost another one. Somebody thought they were stuck like Chuck. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're absolutely not stuck. Hmm? Hmm? somebody said perhaps this, this correlates with lead us not into temptation in the prayer well why did Jesus say lead us not into temptation because by the Holy Spirit he was led to be tempted into the, he was led to be tempted of the devil as soon as you remember that when the Holy Ghost descended upon him like a dove right because he said this my son and whom I am well pleased he was led of the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil 40 days, you remember that? That's what that prayer cites. Lead us not into temptation. In fact, everything the Lord suffered, everything he suffered is in that prayer. He told us how to pray. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In other words, don't have us go through the test of evil. But deliver us from evil. That's a compassion statement. Instead of being tested by evil, that's what happened to Jesus. He had to be tempted in all these major areas. Instead of going through that type temptation process, which, by the way, is a test, right? Instead of going through that, there was a request to deliver us from the evil. That's a merciful statement, knowing that we may not capture all of what we're prone to, but we are concurrently and consistently delivered from evil. You see how that works? That's a statement of compassion. That's why we're kept. That's the intent 
right? That was a mindset of Christ concerning us. And whose responsibility is it to keep us? The Lord Jesus is his responsibility. There you are. Somebody says, I'm walking proof that to train a child up in the way that they should go. And when he is old, he shall not depart from it. Yeah. Yeah. My goodness. The Lord made no mistakes. Why do we always think that somehow God, you know, the atheists have that argument. They say, well, God took my wife or God took my child. And they get mad at God for that. You know what they forget? That child was never theirs. That child was his. Parents are appointed caretakers over a soul for a time. Not forever, for a time. When a person is delivered from the flesh, how can they still be that person's child? I've heard so many stories about the heavens, but you read in the word of God something opposite of what people say. If we shed the flesh, right? Plus, they had their experience, I had mine. How about that? But the word is quite clear. The problem is, we like to believe in these fanciful concepts. Let's go ahead and face it, we do. We like to believe in the fanciful concepts. But the truth, the truth is so much that it's not entered into the minds of men. I believe that sometime when people say they have this near-death experience, here's what I believe. I believe that God shows them what they need to see, a portion of something they need to see, a communication just to them, something they need to see to continue. That's what I believe. It's not a lie. It's part truth, right? But just as an angel can appear in many different ways, that's not deceitful. That's just the way they work, right? I believe that if a person saw a smidget of the true heavens, there'd be no way they could function here on this earth. Do you know how miserable? I'm going to tell you something. I had an experience, and it caused me nothing but misery here. Do you know that? If you could see the perfect place, how in the world could anybody have a desire to be in this world? I lost my complete desire of all things in this world by the smidget of something I saw. I lost everything, and that was at age 10. That's not good to live like that. Do you know how many times I said, but you know, I was better off not even seeing any of that. That's what I said. I was better off not seeing it. Not seeing any of it. Because it exposes too much. It would make a person sick to be here in this world. This world is a, is a, is, it just does it. There's, what good is in this world? The earth is okay, but the world is, is raunchy. It's filthy. It's full of darkness and those who love the darkness. If the Lord shows such a contrast, that wouldn't motivate a person. That would cause a person to be severely homesick. That's what it would do. I believe that the Lord shows people. Because see, God's not a liar. One day, I no, it was a month I sat down and I listened to over, over 400 near-death experiences. You know how they have those old video clips and the little uh, statements about, I examined 400. They had no consistency. None. They didn't have a consistency. How can so many people see a diverse set of things? Now, I believe that was more of a communication than anything else. A person can talk to you, right? And they use different inflections and different tones come out of their mouth. Different wordings, that can mean the same thing. I believe that the dreams are similar. That's a communication for the person. It just so happens that it has visuals in there. It doesn't mean that the elements are false. It means it's a communication. Hmm? It's a communication 
just like some of the things that people saw in the Bible, they were communications. They, were, they weren't absolutes, they were communications, right? Like a sea of glass. A sea of glass is a sea of glass. You can't extract anything other than people on a sea of glass. You see a sea of glass. And I believe that these dreams that people had communicated to them in a way that they would understand. Now, for the missing element, do you know that there are things in the earth that speak by way of emotions? They don't speak with words. They speak by way of emotions. These are the unseen things that people don't know about, and so you cannot consider them in finding the results in whatever you're trying to find out. You're missing too many elements. Too many elements. But when the people from the seas come to the top, that'll be one missing element gone. And with the other things fully manifest, that'll be the, another missing element, but it still will not be the full element. What do you think your father has already established? Well, I'll say it again. If darkness can accomplish and make and present the most beautiful thing, what do you think your father has already accomplished? What most people have seen in this earth that they have called, oh, I saw something that was so beautiful. You know, the Bible tells us that Satan will often manifest as an angel of light. He works within the realm of this, this, this beautiful portion. Satan must beauty himself, so he knows about beauty, right? Men think makeup, a lot of people, you guys think makeup is pretty, right? I think the opposite. I don't like makeup. I'm telling you, I'm a weirdo all the way. I like what the Lord did before the makeup went on. I can extract and see the truth of a person. The makeup only conforms to the style of what people like to see. I don't see by way of that style. I tend to think what God created was flawless in the first place. That's what I think. These adjustments and things that people make, they're unnecessary. Have you noticed that like plastic surgery, these people in Hollywood put plastic surgery, they look normal to each other. So that when they look at a regular person, what are they truly seeing? Because when you look at a person with plastic surgery, it looks like somebody blew up their face with a balloon in certain portions. It looks weird to me. It's unnatural. It looks weird, right? But to them, it looks normal, correct? Here's a big one, ladies. You ready? Here's a contrast between seeing God's natural things as beautiful, right? And seeing the artificial as beautiful. Now, if you get used to seeing the artificial, right? That's going to be beauty in your mind because you're raised with that. What if nobody ever shaved? What if the only thing that people shaved were their faces? How many beautiful people would be on the planet? Huh? Maybe cut the hair, maybe. And only men shave their faces. No eyebrows shaping or any of that. Now, how many would just love to just go out and could look at a person and say, oh, wow, that person's beautiful. But they have a unibrow, right? And they have two patches of hair on the corner of their lips. The ladies. And they have afros on the forearms. Who would think that's beautiful? Who? Could you see beyond that? This is the point I'm trying to make. If you were born to see that every day of your life, you would look beyond the common elements into the beauty of the person is what you would do, is what I'm telling you. But because we're raised with seeing bald-faced people, bald-skinned people, we think that's normal. We are the ones that are changing humanity, conforming it to something it never was. We're doing that. And when children are born and they see this and they grow up with it, they have nothing else to compare with it. Which is why some of the visitations to the heavens people have left over the years. I've noticed they, they change based on the time they were immersed in. The view of heaven changes based on the time they grew up in, so uh, uh, a near-death experience in the 20s is very different from a near-death experience in the 90s. The people look different. The people do different things. They say different things. The speech is different. You go back even further than that, it's different. 
So it's always different. It's always based upon the time that people live in. Well, that shows me no consistency. God does not change heaven because the year is now 2024 versus 2020. That's not what he does, right? And the Bible says God changes not. He is the same yesterday and today and forevermore. We call ourselves evolving because we're always inventing weird things. There are people now that look like aliens. People in Nevada, they see a person like that. They think it's acceptable. Somebody else from some isolated community will see that going to shock. A guy with a split tongue. People with scales on them walking around. People who have surgically altered black eyes i think that would bother people right but it's normal it's normal in las vegas it's normal on the west coast and places like that. It's normal that is so far removed from normal right why do okay ladies explain this this is a big change why does everybody take a picture and they look like a fish somebody explain that to me that's not normal It's not normal to take a picture and look like a fish. What is that? What is that? People change the times. People conform times. And you know who's behind it. You already know who's behind it. He's causing it to be unrecognizable. And what they're truly doing is this, just so you know. What they're truly doing is removing. They're removing it from what God intended it to be. Just because man is doing it does not mean God intended it. So let me remind you, the Lord is coming back to tear down everything man built on this earth. Everything is going to be wiped clean to the ground. Everything. And nothing will stand up. Now, if it were truly pleasing unto the Most High, it wouldn't be melted. Everything on this earth is going to burn up. It's going to be hewn down and burn up. All the idols are going to be removed. Oh, and by the way, you're coming out of your flesh. So that body that you have that's conformed to the new standards, you will not have it. You'll be in a different form. You don't know what you're going to be. You don't know that. This world is an illusion. We're like It's like we're in romper room. And we got paper mache things all over the place. And we're bragging about our paper mache creation. That's what it's like. Full of foolishness. And Satan utilizes everything he can. I get you to turn away from the principles of Christ. Indeed, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he may condemn your soul. He was an accuser of the brethren. He is an accuser of the brethren. And he desires to accuse you. Think about that. Satan desires to accuse all of us. How is he doing that? By having us conform to those things that are indeed an abomination to the Most High. That's how. The small things that seem like they're hardly nothing in this world are huge missteps regarding righteousness. And if we're not careful, we're going to lose our value system in this way in the Lord. Remember something. Let's never forget what the Lord is doing here. Because if we listen to the popular speeches of this world, we're going to forget that our Father is in control of all things. We're going to forget that Jesus is keeping us. We're going to forget that by him we have life in this day. By him we have life in this day. That if we are to protect anything, it is the living God who will grant us the power to do so. But without him, there is no power to protect anything. We can't protect anything without his blessing. Without him granting us power to do so. He is allowing this dark kingdom to spread across the face of the earth. Not the kingdom of light. The kingdom of darkness is rising up and spreading across the face of the earth. And that's what people will run to. 
So be careful of what you parade as a success. Because in my Bible, it says that the kingdom of the beast will be paraded as being successful. A long time ago, people knew this. And they were wary of anybody who would start answering the difficult questions. Remember that? A long time ago, they said, Ooh, only the Antichrist is going to come and be able to fix this stuff in the world. Isn't that what they said? How in the world can we utter one thing? And the very thing we uttered as being evil, we're calling for now, calling it good. we got to be careful. I have a piece of advice. Pray for your leaders, please. And remember, you're in a war. This is a long-standing war. And in this war, there are no breaks. And as the barrier is taken down, and it is, it's starting to fall all over the earth. I mean, it's coming down prematurely. It's not coming later. Evidently, it's coming now. You remember those people I told you will be in the corner of their houses, afraid to move. There'll be people that sit in the corner of their homes so full of fear that they'll die in that corner of starvation and thirst. They will not move from the corner. Can you imagine a person so frightened that they get into the corner of their house and they're so frightened they'll, they won't get something to eat, they won't get something to drink, but they die in that state. That's the fear that's coming. That's what's coming. And people are taking it lightly. And they're not anchored in Christ to be able to withstand that. Because even the Lord said what he was doing, that we may be able to withstand the wiles of the enemy. If we're so easily moved emotionally, how in the world can we ever face the adversary? The darkness that's coming is going to trick people so bad. Those who join it will never depart from it. The darkness is coming. Those who join that darkness will have found their utopia. Those who are enemies of that darkness, if you're not covered by the blood of the Lamb, you will not make it. So it's some serious things. People are talking about these fires passively. Give it within a two-week range. All that will change. They can't see what's developing. In a certain place, there were 3,000 acres burning. Now there's 24,000 acres in that place today. That smoke is coming to the USA. We're going to have to deal with ash. And the smells. And when it comes, the crime rate, it will increase dramatically. It's already unsafe for a lot of people. In the last four days, four mass shootings. In four days. So that means each day had multiple mass shootings, is what I'm saying. You guys, do me a favor and somebody watch the fires in Mexico for COT. Can you do that? Please do that. I'm getting all this stuff in order.
I'm in the KD files tonight at WorkWise, okay? I'm getting this stuff in order. Uh, I need a place where some of you guys can post your things too. So we can keep track of some things here in COT. And I got some publishing to do. I got to fix a few more things to publish. Some of the publishing failed last night. So we, I kind of pulled some code that was, well, this time it wasn't my code. It wasn't mine. That was a network, guys. I don't do networking. I don't like networking. But I can go back and change a few things. Get some postings done. <sighs> Folks with Christ and being anchored in Christ, there is no failure. There's none. Salvation is of the Lord only. Please remember that. And do everything you can to go forward in righteousness, not for payment, not for reward, but revisit the cross. Please. Revisit the cross. Please do that. And with all of what you are, go forward in righteousness. God bless each of you. I will see you guys next time right here at COT. God bless and keep all of you, always. I'll see you next time right here at COT. Thank you.